Hey everyone, it's Kenji. Uh, we're gonna be making some meatloaf. Um, I actually started already, um, but then I thought maybe people won't see that. What I'm doing, so in my book, The Food Lab, oops, as I spill my olive oil. This is my book, The Food Lab. It came out, I don't know, nine years ago, 2000, 2016. Um, so I have this recipe in here for what I called uh, all American meatloaf, but this is one of those recipes where I went through uh, it's very, very long. There's a lot of ingredients in it. Um, I don't know, 20 something ingredients in it and there, it's quite an involved process. Um, and the, the meatloaf that you get at the end is excellent. I mean like really excellent, probably the best meatloaf you'll ever have. Um, and I don't say that lightly, but, um, I also never make it because it is a process. Um, but you know, the, one of the reasons why I made this meatloaf in my book and why a lot of the recipes in this book are very, very complicated is because I really wanted to show what are all the different things you can do. Uh, in a meatloaf and what effect uh, changing those things is going to have on the finished meatloaf. Um, and so I ended up incorporating a ton of different techniques that, um, you know, make your meatloaf maybe, you know, 5% better for 80% more work. Um, and so what I generally do though when I um, make my own food at home is I don't make the recipes exactly as they're written in my book, but I take some lessons from it and I decide how much work I want to put in uh, for the results. So what I generally do for meatloaf is a streamlined version of some of the stuff uh, that's in here. So I'm going to show you how I'm making it and then I'll talk through a bit of um, why, what I'm changing uh, and why. All right, so the first thing I'm doing, I've got a few slices of bread here. Um, you can use bread crumbs, you can use bread. I use a ratio of about one to 10 uh, meat to bread, I'm uh, sorry, bread to meat as far as weight goes. So for every, um, uh, every kilogram of meat, I will use 100 grams of bread. So this is four slices of bread for two pounds of meat, which is about right. Um, I'm using one egg here. I think the recipe in my book calls for two eggs. The reason I'm going down to one egg is because in the book, um, you start with a very sort of liquidy, like almost like a like a batter, right? And because it's so so battery, you don't end up putting it into. It's very difficult to make it into a loaf shape. It doesn't hold its shape until it's actually cooked. Um, and so in the in the book, what I do is I put it into a loaf pan, start it in a loaf pan, and then kind of invert it uh, halfway through cooking after it sort of holds its shape, so that you can then get a glaze on the outside. But when I make it at home these days, I prefer to just have it as a workable mixture that you can form into a shape, glaze, and do all at once without having to, to fiddle with it in the middle of its cooking process. So I only use one egg for it. Um, I'm using some buttermilk here. I'm gonna use about, about a half cup, maybe three quarters of a cup. Uh, the book calls for a combination of buttermilk and chicken stock, uh, and it's about a one and a quarter cups total liquid. Uh, so for the same reason I'm using less liquid now, um, I'm using only buttermilk because I don't want to use two different liquids, but you can, of course, use uh, all buttermilk. You can use a mix of buttermilk and chicken stock. You could use all chicken stock. It doesn't really matter. You want to just add a liquid in here. I like the tanginess that buttermilk gives. All right, so I'm going to season it with some salt. Also going to season it with some pepper. What we're making here is what's called our panade mixture, which is sort of like the, the soaked breadcrumbs that go into meatloaf or go into meat lo uh, meatballs, things like that. Um, the one thing I do keep, I always have powdered gelatin at home. Uh, so this powdered gelatin, I'm going to sprinkle onto that buttermilk into this panade mixture. I'm going to go with about two tablespoons in there. Um, the idea behind the butter, the, the gelatin is that when you're making meatloaf, so traditional meatloaf mixtures that you buy, you know, the, a traditional meatloaf light recipe will call for typically three types of meat, uh, beef, which you, which has sort of the most robust flavor and texture, uh, pork, which is softer and adds sort of a fattiness to it and unctuousness to it, uh, and veal. The important part about veal is that veal is very high in connective tissue that breaks down and turns into gelatin uh, as it cooks. And that gelatin, what it does is it binds liquids very well so that uh, as your meatloaf cooks, the moisture stays inside and you get this really sort of velvety texture in the meatloaf. Um, you can mimic the effect of veal without actually using veal by adding your own powdered gelatin to meatloaf. Um, so when I was make, testing this re meatloaf recipe for my book, what I did was I made a bunch of, you know, what I called sort of meatloaf varietals. So I made meatloaves that were all pork or meatloaves that were all veal, meatloaves that were all beef, etc., so that I could see um, what, and then of course a ton of different different mixtures, of different ratios of, of uh, veal, pork, and, and beef to see what effect those things had on it. Um, anyhow. Uh, I use gelatin and what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this all up with my hands and we want to kind of squish it up into a, a paste. And so that gelatin, normally when you use gelatin, if you've ever made like say a panna cotta, something like that, when you use gelatin you normally sprinkle it over a liquid 
and let it bloom, uh, that is absorb uh, moisture. Um, you don't really need to do that here because obviously you're kind of mixing it into a paste and it's going to bloom itself in this paste uh, as it sits here and rests while you work on your other ingredients. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfectly smooth, but you do want to kind of get rid of the big chunks because we're going to be incorporating this panade into our meat mixture later on. All right, let me give my hands a quick wash. All right, now I'm going to work on my aromatics. So in here I've got chopped onions, carrots, and celery. And I'm going to get those cooking down in a pan. And while those are cooking down, I'll kind of talk to you about that process. I'm using a couple of tablespoons of butter. Pretty moderate heat. I don't really want to brown anything here. I just want to kind of sweat everything out so that it doesn't have that raw texture and flavor. By the way, if you're interested in any of all of any of what I'm talking about right now, um, uh, I have a new podcast with my friend Deb Perlman from Smitten Kitchen. The podcast is called The Recipe. But anyhow, the podcast is about the process of recipe development. Uh, and our second episode is about meatloaf, and we talk about our respective meatloaf recipes uh, and uh, what went into making them. But um, so one of the reasons why, or the reason why you have to saute your vegetables beforehand, because you'd be tempted to just think, all right, everything's gonna get cooked in the oven anyways. I'm gonna take these raw vegetables, mix them in with my raw meat, uh, and just bake it all together. Um, unfortunately, so the problem is that vegetables, they don't soften until they hit uh, around 183 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 90 degrees Celsius. Um, it's because pectin, which is the, um, the glue that holds cells together, vegetable cells together, uh, doesn't really break down until that temperature. And so anywhere below there, your vegetable is still gonna be crunchy and raw. And so in order for you to cook through your vegetables in a meatloaf mixture, you would have to cook it very, very hot. And by the time you get to 183 degrees, your meat is really overcooked. It's like well past the well done stage. Uh, and so your meatloaf would end up sort of drier and tougher than it needs to be. That's why it's pretty important to saute your vegetables uh, before and soften them before you add them to the meatloaf. And sauteing them, of course, also sort of releases some of those more raw, particularly in onions, some of the more raw sulfurous aromas. Um, it, you know, what, what you smell coming out into the kitchen air right now, uh, that's all aromas that are being released from the vegetables and are then gone from the vegetables. Um, and those are the aromas that kind of, when they get trapped inside the meatloaf, well, they can taste, they taste like raw vegetables, uh, which is not ideal. Uh, for meatloaf, at least not ideal for me. Oh, I also got a couple cloves, uh, a few cloves of garlic that I'd minced and put in here. All right, so I'm gonna let that soften up. In the meantime, I've got an equal mixture, um, a pound of beef, 80% uh, lean, 20% fat, uh, along with ground pork. Uh, that fat ratio is, is pretty important. You wanna use full fat beef, although, you know, you, you could even use something like turkey, and because we're adding a uh, panade to this, um, what happens is the panade uh, it, it prevents the meat from binding too tightly to itself. So, you know, meat has proteins that really want to sort of link up uh, and form this mesh. And so it's, it's the, basically the way a sausage is made, right? You take meat, you add salt to it, and you need it to soften the proteins and get them to link up with each other. And that's why a sausage has a kind of bouncy texture to it. Um, with a meatloaf, you kind of want the opposite. You want the, the meat to really not bind to itself at all. You want it to be as tender as possible. So a panade helps do that by physically uh, impeding the interaction of meat proteins uh, gets in their way. Um, so that way it prevents the meat from getting too tight. Uh, so even with a relatively lean meat, uh, you can still uh, get a nice tender and juicy meatloaf by using enough panade. I'm also gonna add a bit of soy sauce here, about a tablespoon of soy sauce. Um, in my original recipe, I think I called for like anchovies and Marmite, maybe soy sauce and fish sauce or a bunch of other things you know, what I call my umami bombs and you could add all those things uh, And you know the more of them you add the more sort of rounded of an umami flavor you get But you can get away with just soy sauce I'm gonna add some Worcestershire in here as well because I'm gonna be using that Worcestershire in my glaze But you could add one or the other or none of those and it'll be perfectly fine so I'm gonna season this with salt now. Um, I know I have roughly uh, a, roughly a kilogram of stuff in this bowl and I'm gonna salt it at about, I wanna go between sort of one and one and a half percent. That's a reasonable amount for a meatloaf. Um, so I'm gonna add about say 10 or 12 grams of salt, okay. I'm also going to season it well with pepper, black pepper. 
You can add other seasonings in here as well. You can add some uh, paprika. If you don't want to go salt, you could also add something like uh, straight up chicken bouillon or beef bouillon. Uh, that'll give it a little bit even more of that umami kick. All right, and now these vegetables are sauteed. So I'm gonna pop them in here. Finally, I'm gonna pop in some, I bought all this uh, pre-grated cheese because uh, it was on sale for like 97 cents a bag or something at Safeway. Um, so I have a ton of pre-grated cheese. I normally don't go with pre-grated cheese, but I got it all, so I'm gonna use it. Um, I'm gonna add about uh, maybe four ounces of pre-grated cheese, about 120 grams or so. Cheese, totally optional in your meatloaf. Many people would think it's weird. Some people think it's essential. I sometimes add it, I sometimes don't. Sometimes I like to add Parmesan in there, but today I'm using this because I got it. Um, at this point, you can also add herbs, you know, something like parsley uh, or thyme, but I don't have any parsley or thyme. I used it all up today, so I'm not gonna add herbs. Chives would also be great in here. And I'm just gonna knead this all together. Now, you don't wanna overwork this mixture. You want it to be homogenous, but as soon as you get to that homogenous point, you want to kind of stop mixing because over mixing uh, is what's going to get it more tough. And with meatloaf, you really want it to be as tender as possible. So as soon as you don't see, uh, you know, sort of big chunks of big swaths of like just pork or big swaths of just beef or, or panade, um, as soon as it's pretty well mixed together. Okay. That looks about right. All right. So at this point I'm going to, I have a pan here prepared, lined with parchment. Oh, I'm gonna get my oven on. 350, okay. I've got wet hands here, okay? That's what makes meatloaf and meatballs much easier to work with. You wanna keep your hands wet. And then I'm just gonna kinda plop it into the center of this pan. Let's get rid of that one large onion shard. Oh, I guess that's a cheese shard, never mind. All right, wet hands again. We want to form a kind of freeform loaf shape. You don't want to give like sort of relatively square ends, not completely sort of football shaped because I don't, know, I don't like having those really tiny pieces at the end, although it doesn't really matter to be honest. You can have, you can have tiny pieces at the end if you'd like. By the way, if you want to double check the seasoning on your meatloaf, what you can do is you can just grab a little piece off like this. Okay. Grab a little piece off. I will grab a uh, little bowl and wash my hands. And then you microwave it for about 10 seconds. You can do this whether you're making meatloaf or sausage or meatballs. If you wanna just double check the seasoning, make sure that everything, t everything tastes right before you uh, throw it in the oven because you, know, you can't just taste raw meatloaf mix. So this is one of those cases where um, you know, you can't taste as you go. You kind of just have to, if you don't do this, you kind of just have to fly blind. Um, if you don't have a microwave, you can also, that's not quite done. If you don't have a microwave, you can also do it, uh, you know, pan sear a little, you know, like a little dime sized piece in a, in a, in a pan until it's cooked through. Just like a little mini burger patty, you know? All right. Ooh, that's a hot bowl. Let's see how this tastes. Seasoning's good. Yeah, you know, when you measure the seasoning, it pretty much always comes out. Well, it does always come out right because measuring is measuring. All right, so I'm gonna throw this in the oven there. And I'm gonna cook it until it comes to around 140 degrees. That, uh, it'll probably take, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. I'm gonna set my timer to 35 uh, and see where we are at the end of that. All right, so I will see you in. Just a couple minutes because uh, I'm gonna add some bits of information. I'm also gonna make my glaze. Um, so 140 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 60 degrees Celsius, by the way. Um, and that's not gonna be my final cooking temperature. It's gonna end up being around 100, 
150 degrees Celsius after I'm done with everything. So, sorry, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, so around um, 65 degrees Celsius. Um, but at 145, at 140 degrees, that's when I'm going to add my my uh, glaze. So I'm going with about my glaze here. By the way, I'm using that same exact pan. You don't need to get a whole new pan messy. Oh, I don't know. I guess I'm going with about a half cup of ketchup because there's not much left in this jar. And this is all the ketchup I have in the house. Normally I would go maybe a little bit more, like three quarters of a cup of ketchup. This is a pretty classic meatloaf glaze. If you listen to that podcast episode, um, what you find out, or what I found out, because Deb did the research for that episode, is that um, the reason why so many American meatloaves um, are glazed with Heinz ketchup now is because back before we used to use the internet, sorry, I got cut off for a second. Back before we used to use the internet to find our recipes, we would use the back of packaging for recipes frequently. Um, you know, and this, that still happens, but it feels like it's not as much of a thing these days. Um, but Heinz ketchup did this big meatloaf thing where they said, you know, they, they convinced people to glaze their meatloaves with Heinz ketchup. Uh, and it worked, you know, and so now we all glaze our meatloaf with Heinz ketchup. Anyhow, uh, ketchup, I'm doing about equal parts ketchup and brown sugar. This is going to be a sort of sweet and tangy glaze, almost like a, uh, almost like a barbecue sauce. Yeah. Splash of cider vinegar. By the way, if you want the exact measurements of everything I'm doing here, well, you can't have them because I'm just eyeballing it. But if you want measurements that you can follow what I'm doing here, uh, you can get that. You can get that all written up. I'll write it all up on my uh, on my Patreon. I'll leave a link, you know. But it's uh, Kenji Lopez Alt on Patreon. Um, it's a good way to support me also because, uh, you know, I don't do any partnerships. I don't take any advertisements. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, you get something, I get something, right? Uh, Worcestershire sauce, little stash of Worcestershire sauce, ketchup, brown sugar, and uh, cider vinegar. So we're basically just going to just cook this until, um, until that sugar is dissolved. And that's going to be our whole glaze. You know, I'm going to throw a dash of soy sauce in there also. All right. And that's all we're looking for. Just bring it up to a simmer. Make sure that sugar's dissolved. Taste it. Mm, yeah, got a nice tangy balance. And that's it. I'm just going to let that cool. Uh, and I will later on brush it onto my meatloaf when it's done. So now I will see you when my meatloaf is done or ready to be lacquered. So that'll be 45 minutes or so. And my meatloaf is now at around 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's check it. Whew, almost spot on, a little bit less. Okay, so at this stage, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit it with some of that glaze. I'm gonna pump up the oven temperature actually to basically as hot as it goes. And our idea here is now we want to lacquer this. So we're going to hit it with some of this glaze. With a brush here, like this. And I'm going to do this in sort of three applications, three layers. Okay, so actually because because there I have less glaze than I was planning on making because I had less ketchup than I planned on. Maybe I'll only do two layers of it. But here we go. That's going to go into this 150 degree oven. Uh, sorry, 500 degree oven now, hot as the oven goes for about three minutes. And then I'm gonna repeat that lacquering process, all right? So I will see you again in well more than three minutes. Um, sorry, my, uh, in case you haven't surmised, it is it is late at night, right? In fact, this is midnight, this is midnight meatloaf. Um, my, my toddler woke up with a nightmare and so I had to go handle that. Um, so I took the meatloaf out after, out after the first three minutes. I was about to give it a glaze uh, and then my toddler woke up. But here it is now. I'm giving its little second coating of glaze. It'll go back into the, uh, into the oven. You might be saying to yourself right now, but Kenji, if it's midnight, who are you gonna be serving this meatloaf to you to right now? Um, the answer is I'm gonna be serving a slice of this to myself. And the rest, we're gonna be reheating because meat, meatloaf is one of those things that actually reheats really nicely. If you've ever been to a diner and ordered a meatloaf, uh, I guarantee you they aren't cooking that meatloaf fresh to order. <laughs> All right, so this is going to go back in. I did end up getting three uh, three coats of it, so that's going to go in for another three minutes. So I will see you in three more minutes. All right. Ooh, that glaze is looking pretty good, huh? 
All right, so we'll do our final layer here. And there. There we go. Now one more time in the oven and we are all done. So I'll see you again in three more minutes. All right. So we are done here. Woo. Look at that. So at this stage, if um, my son hadn't woken up screaming with a nightmare uh, and I didn't um, basically let this meatloaf rest for like 30 to 45 minutes, uh, at this stage I would let it rest. However, the meatloaf had already rested and it reached its sort of equilibrium temperature in the middle, which I, I, it should be around 150 degrees. Yep, 150, spot on. Um, so that's what we're aiming for, around 150 degrees. It could be around, it could go up to 160 degrees or so, but anyhow, uh, this has reached its equilibrium. We don't have to let it rest again now because it already did rest. Um, I just basically reheated the outside to get that glaze going. Uh, and so now I'm just gonna transfer it over to my cutting board. And take off a slice and see what we got inside, all right? You see how juicy it is? Ooh. Oh, look at those juices coming out. All right, let's give it a taste. Mmm, <laughs> tender and juicy. Succulent. This is an excellent meatloaf. Um, so could this be like 5% better by doing some of the things I tell you in my book? You know, like for example, uh, you could grind up some mushrooms with the um, with the uh, panade and add them in there. It'll add a little bit of savoriness to it. It'll also sort of break up the meat a little bit more. Yeah, you can do that. Um, you, could you add some Marmite in here, some anchovies, make it a little bit more umami? Um, sure, you could do that too. Mm. But those are all choices you can make. You know, you want, you want you can choose whether you want to make it a little bit better uh, for a little bit more work or a lot more work as the case would be. Mm. Or if you just want it to be um, good enough, which is this good. <laughs> Usually I choose just good enough, you know, because I, I'm a realistic person and I got a family to feed. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of person that can be up at midnight, up, up, uh, making meatloaf until midnight. All right. If you want the full recipe and the full breakdown of all the things that go into meatloaf, um, you can find that in my book, the food lab where I talk about sort of every element that goes into meatloaf and how um, changing those elements will give you a different result. Okay. Uh, I'll leave a link for this below. You can order signed copies. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want just this basic recipe, the recipe, the exact one that I made here um, with more precise measurements, um, I will leave a link to my Patreon below. Um, or you can just, you know, follow along in the video and I basically showed you how to do it. And if you want to hear more discussion about meatloaf between me and Deb Perlman, um, who is the founder of smittenkitchen.com and another wonderful recipe developer, um, you can tune in to The Recipe with Kenji and Deb, our new podcast, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, all right, guys, gals, non-binary pals, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.